So welcome everyone at Zoom, welcome in the room. Um, we're at the San Francisco Dharma Collective community run organization. And I just love the kind of combination of this model of the Dharma Collective with this class on ethics. Uh, because it feels like the Dharma Collective is this kind of embodiment of um, an alternative to some of the forms of economy that we have that might um, not be as ethical. Um, so we don't have one particular lineage or teacher here. It's run by the Sangha, the board and volunteers. So um, welcome to everyone. Uh, this is a series of classes on embodied ethics. So kind of cultivating secular ethics through meditation, reflection and discussion. Uh, my name is Tig for those that I haven't met. Uh, I'm a meditation teacher. I teach primarily in hospitals and universities. Uh, I'm currently consulting with Mayo Clinic and developing their Center for Mindfulness, um, working at Brown University on a research study uh, called Mindfulness-Based Queer Resilience, and also teaching contemplative art at Pratt Institute. Um, so very secular based programs. Uh, my training is in mindfulness based stress reduction and cultivating emotional balance, which have roots in Dharma, um, but is presented in a secular way, which we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, my personal practice is informed by Vipassana and Tibetan Dharma, um, but I do hold space in a secular way. Um, so uh, no dogma or doctrine, um, no need to believe for sure in reincarnation or karma uh, in order to practice and, and take these teachings and, and discuss these issues. Uh, I like to think of them as universal dharma, um, universal truth. So let's take some time just to welcome ourselves into this space. Um, we'll just take maybe uh, eight or nine minutes just for an opening practice. So finding a way of being that feels comfortable for the next 10 minutes or so. And signaling that we're entering into a period of formal practice. Maybe that means closing the eyes or keeping them opening, open and softening the gaze. maybe sitting up a little bit taller, sense of lengthening from the tailbone all the way up to the crown of the head. And then cultivating a sense of ease. So relaxing the muscles of the face and the jaw, down into the shoulders, the abdomen, the pelvic floor, just letting this wave of relaxation move through the body. See what relaxes and releases along the way, and maybe areas that don't. And inviting the possibility that it can be there and we don't have to struggle or judge with that unpleasantness or discomfort, just creating space for it to be here exactly as it is. And just taking a moment to notice the energy that you're carrying right now. Maybe noticing the energy from activities during the day, conversations. Maybe noticing a, a busy energy in the mind stream, lots of thoughts, thinking about the day or the to-do list. Not trying to change or fix anything, just noticing what it's like for you right now. Perhaps uh, energy in the body, a sense of sleepiness or perhaps wakefulness. Just noticing what's here right now in this present moment for you. And whatever it is that you're finding, welcoming it, allowing it to be here.
And perhaps to ground in a little bit more, bringing the attention to the feeling of the support beneath the body, perhaps returning to that possibility of relaxing into the support, letting it hold you. Perhaps a, a sense of stability and steadiness, even if it's just in the steady support of the ground beneath you. And you're taking a moment just to acknowledge the land that you're on. Those that may have come before, the indigenous people, if you're in the Bay Area, the lands of the Olani tribe, wherever you may be, just a moment to recognize and honor those that came before on this land. And let's now shift from the body into the domain of the mind and just call to mind what it is that brought you here tonight. Perhaps a sense of curiosity, wanting to explore what embodied ethics means. Perhaps to practice in community. Maybe just to rest and take this precious time as a gift to yourself, to practice, to learn, to grow. And then considering your motivation for being here. So not just why, but what is behind that? to find more ease in your life, help support others around you. And then finally calling to mind an intention, a way that you'd like to show up for yourself or others, maybe an attitude that you'd like to embody in our session tonight. Curiosity, beginner's mind, perhaps an intention not to judge or analyze yourself, your practice, or even others. And then if you'd like to join me in a few deep breaths, perhaps directing the in-breath into the heart an awareness of that intention. And then as you exhale, letting go of any expectation of how this session may go or how that intention may come to fruition. Another deep breath in, allowing the abdomen to expand. Relaxing as you breathe out. One more breath, just like that. And at the next exhale, letting go of that breath, relaxing into a transition out of that short opening practice, taking some time to invite some gentle movement into the body to help make that transition, maybe wiggling the fingers or toes, maybe some stretches and taking your time to transition back to open eyes as you're ready. Welcome. So welcome to those that are joining online. Good to have you with us. Um, 
So thank you for joining me in that opening practice, just to kind of welcome yourself into the space and take some time to consider what it is that brought you here and what your intention is. We'll have lots of time to share um, after our main practice. Um, for those of you that are just joining, we are kind of exploring um, through a series of classes, this idea of embodied ethics. Um, so uh, this is kind of stemming from my own uh, way of relating to ethics and being in a world that I find highly unethical. Um, I shared last week, uh, a lot of this was driven from my own awakening um, in 2012, when I kind of woke up to the waters that we swim in of capitalism and consumerism, materialism, this kind of very self-centered culture that we live in. Uh, I was a, a marketing director uh, in a large company and um, was really shocked to see, you know, the level of psychological manipulation and objectification of the human body and labor. Uh, and just felt a really deep sense of dissatisfaction with what I was seeing in the world. And um, for the past eight years, I've really been experimenting in alternative forms of, of being in this world and um, exploring gifting economy, resource-based sharing, renunciation of my material goods, um, living nomadically. These are all things that I'm trying to various degrees of comfort and discomfort. Um, but this is my practice, how I embody uh, a more ethical way of being, or at least strive and, and um, intend to. Um, and I hear a lot of talk in the community about how destructive capitalism particularly is, or the systems of oppression, um, and don't really see a lot of action. There, there is in some ways, and, and then not a lot in others. And there seems to be some bypassing happening. There's an awareness that there are problems and discomfort. Um, but what do we do? What do we do about it? And I can certainly relate to the feeling that it just feels so big. These, these systematic problems um, seem so deeply ingrained and so big. Uh, and it, it feels impossible to try and fight it. Um, so I wanted to create this series of classes to help explore kind of these ideas of secular ethics and how we can use meditation to cultivate them and also conversations and reflections on what this might mean for you or look like in your life. Um, I like the idea of kind of this class as a container for people to share and discuss. So we'll leave um, a good amount of time at the end for us to, to talk. Um, so if you're interested in kind of going deeper into secular ethics and kind of what informs this class, uh, you can go to the YouTube channel for the Dharma Collective and check out those first two classes uh, where I kind of really laid out kind of the framework of um, influences and point of view that I'm teaching from. Um, but the short version, uh, ethics, you know, the, this idea of moral, moral principles that inform our action and behaviors, uh, the morality really coming from these guiding principles. And then the ethics are more about the way that we take action on them. Um, you'll you hear me use the word secular a lot. So there's no religion that's required here. There's no particular worldview or belief system that you need to have. There's nothing supernatural about um, these teachings or required. Uh, there's no faith required here. Um, so as much as possible, I try to avoid dogma or doctrine in these teachings, keeping it accessible and universal. Um, and then the word embodied, so it's embodied ethics. A lot of times ethics can be very heady, very cognitive, very uh, intellectual, and that's good and important. And we also have to feel, we have to embody these ethics. We can't just think and talk about them, but also explore and stay with the felt experience in the body, um, model them and kind of let what we discover through these classes ripple out into the world through our own modeling. Um, so some of the, the past two classes, we talked about the pillars of secular ethics. Uh, so this idea of 
in in lieu of not having agreed upon religious point of view or worldview that we can operate from um, these two pillars of interdependence and shared humanity is kind of what we operate these ethics from. Um, so again, if you're interested in going deeper into those, you can check out the YouTube channel for class one and two. Uh, interdependence, this interconnectivity of all things, not just that things are connected, but they're interconnected. They depend on things that came before and what comes after. Um, so we don't operate, even though we feel like we're separate, we're not really operating in a world where we're independent and solo uh, in silos. So this groundwork of interdependence is a really important aspect to um, like a platform for these ethics. And then likewise, shared humanity, uh, which is what we talked about last week. So this idea that this one common thing that all humans, all animals, all forms of life, plants, even down to the smallest little cells, we all share the same idea that we want to move closer to things that are supportive and constructive for our well-being. We want to feel good. We want to be healthy. Uh, and we want to move away from things that are destructive or harmful or don't feel good. We all share that all forms of life have that common shared experience. So between the interdependence and that shared um, like shared experience that we're having in, in this embodiment is what we kind of ground our ethics in. So we're kind of approaching the place in this series where we can start really diving into the specific ethics. Interdependence and shared humanity are not necessarily ethics in and of themselves. They're just platforms of the system of ethics that we're going to start jumping into. So tonight we're going to talk about do no harm. Uh, and we're going to have some time to embody an awareness around that through a mindfulness practice. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about what that concept means for me. Um, and then we'll have lots of time to kind of reflect and, uh, and talk a little bit about how we might be orienting ourselves to uh, harm that we might be causing inadvertently or consciously. Um, so this idea of do no harm, some may be familiar in the yogic traditions of it being called ahimsa, um, which translate as do no harm, really this aspiration to avoid causing harm or suffering, um, both to self and others at the planet. Um, and there's lots of big, obvious ways, you know, that we're not violent. And we, we watch our words with people that we recycle, you know, we take care of the planet to the best that we can. And then also there's a lot of really nuanced ways that we might be doing harm, causing harm for ourselves or others around us. We might be participating in systems of oppression without really even being aware of it. Or if we are, we don't know what to do about it. Um, so this is kind of a, a big one in, in the system of secular ethics of not causing harm. Uh, and so tonight, really, the theme is inviting a sense of awareness into this. And that might include feelings of guilt or shame. You know, a lot has been coming up in this series of feeling bad about ways that we might not be ethically moving in the world or causing suffering of other beings. Um, and so the invitation here is to really keep in mind the difference between shame and guilt. Shame is, guilt is I did something bad. Shame is I am bad. Uh, and so shame is where we can kind of go more into the destructive aspect of that, that regret or resentment, whereas guilt can actually be healthy. It can actually um, propel us into meaningful change. Um, so uh, we have to turn and look at these things that are uncomfortable, even if they do bring up guilt or um, discomfort. Um, before we get into the practice, I actually want to just share one of the big overarching frameworks of this teaching tonight, because I don't want to continue any further with people thinking that this do no harm thing is like we're going to be able to accomplish that in the next hour, um, maybe even not in this lifetime. So for me, sometimes the word, the phrase do no harm can kind of feel dogmatic, even just in the way that those words come together. Um, and so I like to approach this uh, uh, in, in three ways. Try not to do harm. <laughs> 
um, be aware of harm that I might be causing? And how can I offset the harm? So if I am causing harm to the planet because of driving a car, how could I offset that? So that we're not trying to walk out of here as saints. I certainly am not, even though I am a perfectionist, <laughs> a recovering perfectionist, I still haven't gotten the do no harm thing down. <laughs> so I just wanted to start with that before we even get into our main practice, because um, I think it can just invite a sense of ease and being realistic about what do no harm means um, for us and in our practice. So knowing that change begins with ourself um, and the practice tonight, we're going to come inwards. We're going to do an embodied awareness practice, otherwise known as mindfulness. Choose an anchor of our sensory experience that we want to pay attention to. And then as we go through um, this practice, which will be about 20 minutes, maybe a little bit less, um, we'll notice how we might be causing harm in our own practice, how our mind, how our um, inner critic, how our judgments um, of ourselves, of other people, of sound, of things that we might label as distractions to our practice might actually be causing harm for ourselves. So an invitation here to see this practice as an opportunity to um, look in at how our inner dialogue or inner world might be causing harm for ourselves, And then we'll transition to talking about what that means um, on kind of the relative scale with each other and in our communities. So uh, let's start to transition into another period of practice, maybe closing the eyes, perhaps softening the gaze once again, perhaps Returning to that sense of a dignified posture, knowing that you can be seated for this practice in a chair or on a cushion on the floor. You can lay down, you can stand up, you can even change postures. And as we start to settle into a practice, Finding an object of your sensory experience to pay attention to, maybe for this practice, it's the breath. Maybe you like to bring your awareness to sensations in the body. Perhaps for this practice, you like to bring all of your awareness to sound and see this as a practice of deep listening. or maybe paying attention to your thoughts. So just choosing an aspect of your sensory experience, one of your senses that you'd like to use as an anchor into the present moment. And then letting the mind begin to settle around that sensory experience. So like two streams of water flowing into one, all of your awareness flowing into all of that sensory experience. If you're with the breath, perhaps noticing the gentle flow of the inhale, the exhale. If you're with sensations in another place in the body, perhaps noticing shape or texture or temperature, the sensations that you're noticing. If you're with sound, just noticing the rise and fall of sounds, steady and consistent, and those sounds that are more abrupt, the space in between sounds. And similarly, if you're with thoughts, just noticing the rise and fall of thoughts, the space in between. Mm -hmm. 
perhaps noticing the moment to moment experience of that sensory object shifting and changing as the practice unfolds. Just being the curious observer, the receiver of the experience that you're having. And perhaps by now or inevitably, you'll notice the mind moving away from that sensory experience. Perhaps getting lost in thought, maybe drifting into uh, sounds that you're hearing or other sensations in the body. It's our first opportunity to practice do no harm. There's nothing wrong with the wandering mind. In fact, it's an opportunity to practice returning with a sense of ease, grace. So anytime you notice that the mind has slipped away from the object you're paying attention to, you can practice this ethic of do no harm. Just by noticing that that's what happened, perhaps taking a moment to relax in body and mind once again. And then whenever you're ready, returning back to the sense object that you've chosen without a hint of anything wrong happening. And as you gently rest your awareness on that sense object, notice if there's an analysis or judgment of what's happening in your experience. Perhaps shoulds or should nots be happening. Maybe expectations of how you feel this practice should be going. And perhaps considering this analysis or judgment as causing harm. So how can we meet those moments with a sense of compassion for ourselves? It makes sense that these things are happening, the mind moving, sounds outside, unpleasant experiences in this practice. Me meeting whatever it is that you're noticing, even if it's uncomfortable, with a sense of ease and allowance. Oftentimes trying to push away things that are uncomfortable in our practice creates a sense of harm, creates a sense of suffering or resistance. And likewise, if we're clinging on to pleasant experiences or sensations, this also too can be a source of harm striving, expecting it to be a certain way, rather than just being with the experience exactly as it is.
noticing if there's any forcing of the attention or striving to keep the attention on the sense object and know that that too can be causing harm in the practice forcing the attention rather than gently allowing it to notice what's happening And even though we're using our sense object as the anchor for this practice, perhaps considering this practice to also be noticing when we might be causing harm, resisting, forcing, judging. Offering a moment of understanding and empathizing with that experience we're having, it makes sense. Years of conditioning, this inner dialogue of the inner critic. All we have to do in this practice is just notice that that's what's happening. And the anchor simply becomes a home base, a safe place to return to again and again. An invitation here to take care of yourself in this practice. So if you notice you're moving into a hyper arousal and activation, strong emotions, or even a hypo arousal, a disassociation or a zoning out, maybe opening the eyes and looking around the room or taking a moment just to feel the body resting in the chair, not causing any further harm by forcing yourself to stay in the practice if that's not what you need right now.
And as we enter into the final minutes of this practice, just taking a moment here to notice the posture. If there's any slouching or slumping that might be causing harm to the practice, coming back into that dignified posture, a sense of lengthening along the spinal column, noticing if any areas in the body tightened or tensed up during the course of this practice and inviting that sense of ease. And then returning back to the object of your mindfulness. And one final transition that we're gonna make before we come to an end of this practice. So letting go of the object of your awareness, taking a moment here to reflect on what that practice may have been like. And if you notice in particular, any ways that you might be causing harm in your own practice, expectations, judgments, analysis, the inner critic. And then expanding that reflection to any ways that you might be causing harm to yourself even outside of the practice. 
are there destructive behaviors or thought patterns? Actions and behaviors that are not conducive to your own well being. And again, not to feel shame, but just bringing this loving awareness to ways that we might be causing harm for ourselves. And these might be coming to you as words or statements, perhaps images or memories. And then expanding your field of awareness to ways that you might be causing harm towards others. These might be actions or behaviors, perhaps systems that you're participating in that cause harm to others. And again, remembering you have agency in this practice. So if difficult emotions or responses to these questions are arising, you're welcome to shift your awareness back into the body or open the eyes. And one final layer of expansion on this reflection is how might we be causing harm to the environment that we live in, in particular, the planet Earth? and namely our carbon footprint. And we all have one. Just taking a moment to reflect on our wants and our needs and the impact that that might be having on the planet. And as uncomfortable as some of these reflections may be for you, know that the bravery that it takes to turn towards an acknowledgement of the ways we might be harming ourselves, others, or the planet is the first step in change. So an invitation to let that bravery linger with you, even as we start to transition out of this practice, And as we come to an end of this meditation, taking your time to invite some movement back into the body, returning back to open eyes as you're ready, allowing an awareness of the light and each other to come back into your attention. So thank you all for joining me in that practice. I'd love to hear a little bit about what might have come up for you in that practice, both in the uh, idea of not harming ourselves in our mindfulness practice, and also that reflection of how we might be causing harm. Um, if you're in the room, uh, please kindly use our friend the microphone so uh, folks at home can hear. Um, and if you're online, you can uh, either raise your hand or just unmute yourself and speak. Also welcome to add uh, any thoughts or experiences into the chat and Tia will help us uh, monitor that. So what was that like? What did you notice in that practice? What came up for you?
Um, this is Daniel. And for me, the, there, at one point, I think you used the word safety. And that was helpful for me in viewing the focus as a practice of feeling safe. I think that being really just focused on a sensory experience as opposed to thought for me feels like I'm not in control. And so there's like a fear around that. Mm. So kind of like reframing it as this is safety. And I, I was actually using the word home, mm. like this is home. Mm. And then like all of that other stuff. I don't know if you used this word or if the, the, or if it came to my mind, but it was the word turmoil, mm. which was for like everything else. That trying to figure out, the trying to plan. Mm. And I and I visualized it like kind of like a layer of smog. Um, which is helpful because there's like stuff above the smog, mm. you know, like in my meditations, I try to like be like above everything, so to speak, so that I can observe it when, you know, when it, when um, I'm able to without demonizing it. Mm. So also just, um, trying to allow that turmoil or chaos. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. So you use the word demonize, but it sounds harmful. Yes. Mm. And then the antidote to that was. Well, actually, I heard from, I heard this from Tara Brock one time, this this practice of saying this to belongs. Mm -hmm. So something along those lines, or sometimes I'll just say the word yes. Mm -hmm. Like yes, this is a this is what is here. Yeah. But not causing any further harm by trying to push it away or make it be different. Just exactly as it is. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. I see some activity happening in the chat. Yeah. Hi, I'll, I'll talk. Um, Great. Yeah. Yeah, we were just having some trouble with the video, that's all. <laughs> in the okay. chat. Tech stuff. Um, yeah, I uh, was really nice to relax and um, uh, how do I explain this? Sorry, not too articulate right now, but um, the harm was actually trying to do a concentration practice for me. I've been, um, uh, my mind and life has been so full that I've been fooling around with different kinds of meditation to see what works. And um, today it was once again to do open awareness and just mind as sky. And but mm -hmm. it just, I just loved the way you you just gave us space to see if there was any self-harm. And even if it was very simple, it's like, oh yeah, concentration is making me um furrow my brow. Concentration is tightening me. Let me mm -hmm. loosen up, you know. So mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. And um, we did have uh, someone write in the chat, um, and I'm happy to read it out loud. Uh, Sarana wrote, what came up for me is, oh, wow, I'm so grateful to be here in teachings. The force, the flow is with take. <laughs> with all of us, but thank you for that. For me, as we started expanding, it became a quagmire very quickly. 
because who defines what harm is? Mm. A lot of activist work. There are people on the other points of view who might consider my work quote unquote harmful. And another part is one of the huge benefits of the pandemic is nature has been recovering because we haven't been out there doing all of our travel. You know, we've got otters in places we haven't seen them in forever. We have far. I really thought that shift energetically as soon as the screen changed, it was like we went from this big group to. They're still here. We have just lost our ability to see that. But we can't hear them either. How about now? Hello, hello. Talking, talking. Well, I can hear when all else fails, turn it off and turn it back on again. <laughs> Um, so we can hear you now. Can you hear us? Yeah, I haven't had any problem. It's just suddenly people talked over and I didn't know what happened. I, I think they're having some technical uh, connection stuff in the space. This one it's funny, I was teaching uh, at Pratt today and the same thing happened twice. So it seems to be my, our shared karma for the day. <laughs> um, can you hear us now? Yeah, great. Excellent. All right. Um, so if we could let uh, maybe let Lance finish and then whatever's next. Um, Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for your patience. Thank you, Daniel and Tia, for working that out. OK, let's pick so, back up where you. Yeah. So I was just commenting that there have been big benefits in the pandemic in that nature has recovered in areas that were unexpected and wonderful, we're seeing animals we haven't. Um, and like a lot of folks, I'm going out into the world again and I'm gonna have a long delayed air trip. And I know that mm. that is bad for the environment, but I also know travel is good for people and understanding. So again, there's a real, I see a real quagmire around what harm is. Yeah. How how are you orienting to let's just stay with this flight, for example, like how knowing that that flight is going to cause a carbon emission? How are you orienting to that? How do you feel about that? You are on mute, Lance. How about this way works? Um, <laughs> it is a complicated thing. Um, I think in some points of view, we should all continue to not go places. Um, but I know that my life is much enriched by travel. And I think interacting with people who are different from us is enriching and can only be towards the good for thought. And still, I'm be, be contributing to putting horrible stuff in the air. So I don't have like a resolution to that. I'm just aware of it and, you know, try to make good choices as best I can. But I'm also aware that in some ways, this is not a good choice. Mm. I appreciate the kind of cost benefit analysis. And that's a big part of where, you know, this can get tricky because it is super subjective. I operate on a definition of harm as destruction. Um, so if it's causing destruction, it's harmful. Um, but as you were noticing that there are benefits to it, we a sense of connectivity and progress that we might have, the open-mindedness that we get when we travel and experience different cultures. So in this case, you know, it's not, well, in all cases, it's the, the purpose of tonight is not really about feeling that shame. It's just noticing. What is it like to know that I am causing this larger footprint? And are there possible ways that I can offset it? 
you know, maybe that's part of the cost benefit also. So, um, but I love what you're sharing is right now, it's really just about awareness. And it's amazing how many people don't even know about their carbon footprint of flying and how damaging it is. So even just as a first step, naming, naming it, that it is harmful, um, can actually be helpful. Thank you for sharing that. Louisa, did you have your hand up? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. I was going to put it in the chat because I wasn't sure. Um, yeah, I was having a having a complicated day. A lot of little things going wrong. And the practice really has allowed me to to get into the space of feeling really sad. And as soon as I started feeling really sad, my dog just jumped on my lap. I think she would be a really good therapy dog. Um, mm. And I just shed some tears and I definitely feel a lot lighter now. So I thank you for holding the space. Um, and then I was just reflecting a little bit about, about the ethics thing and how it's so it's so hard to define as you're saying you know because for instance uh the one thing that comes to mind is the whole thing that a lot of the activists will say over and over again the best thing you can do for the environment the climate activists i mean to say Best thing you can do for the environment is stop eating meat. And I think that's not quite true because, you know, like as I know, I don't know if everyone knows, but regenerative agriculture is actually good for the environment. So eat less meat, not necessarily stop eating meat. There's a lot of fake meat products that can be way worse for the environment. So that's that's one of the things that kind of comes up as like getting meat and of course factory farming is horrible but just saying that meat is like this blanket statement that eating meat is evil and no one should eat meat it's just i think it's a overreach and i really try to live in a place of both end you know like i drive a car that consumes gas I try to carpool when I can. I try to drive less, but I know that I have that impact. I know that like I try to do one long trip to visit my family a year. Um, I don't travel much more than that. So I, yeah, I've been in this game of trying to figure it out, you know, and one of the things I say a lot is like, well, at least I'm not having kids. <laughs> That's a pretty big one. But then I think everyone should be able to have a kid if they want to. You know, it's like I don't want to shame anyone for it, especially if they're going to raise a fine human. So yes. we also need those. So, yeah, just uh, I really like this. Um, this space where we can discuss this thing. So I'm grateful to be here and uh, part of this conversation. Thank you, T. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Can I ask you a question, Louisa? Yeah. How does it feel when you were the last part of what you were sharing was um, that you're trying different things or that you're bringing your awareness to ways that you can potentially lessen the harm? How does that feel? Is there is there a felt experience in the body when you articulate that? Yeah, it's it's interesting because it's it gets to that place of like feeling righteous mm. and i don't necessarily want to have like an inflated ego of like oh i'm tr i'm doing the right thing you know like i went to the farmer's market today which is way more expensive than buying things in the grocery store but i know that i'm supporting people that get paid a better wage and farmers that do good work so it's like this i i I get on this weird place of like, don't let your ego be too inflated. 
by right. the fact that you're like doing less harm, you know, do it because you feel compelled to do it. But yeah, that's that's definitely like a, a fine line there. Yeah, and and because it feels good, right? It feels good. Like the, I have a carbon footprint. You know, I, mm -hmm. I cause there is harm that I cause, but I also know very similar to you that I am trying to do less harm. And for me, that feeling is um, there's a bit more of like a settling in my body when I think of that. So, you know, I appreciate some of the things that you're naming. And also what I love, too, about your your kind of statements around eating meat do your research. You know, we, we all have, we, Lisa's done her research here, you know? So like, we all have to look at um, the nuances of this. Where is our food coming from? Where is our clothing coming from? Where are our cars and our technology coming from? And it's inconvenient and it takes time. It takes me forever to buy an article of clothing because I have to do, I have put this standard on myself that I know exactly where it's coming from um, and that it's as ethically made and produced as possible. Um, but it takes time. You know, my friends kind of tease me because it's like, well, wow, it's, you know, I went to I went to the Himalayas for a year and it took me like two months to decide on a jacket <laughs> because like for me, it was important to do the research, you know, and find out what it is. And with that particular example around the impact on the environment that eating meat has, and you named it, that maybe it's not so much about this black and white eating meat or not eating meat, but eating less meat or being aware of where the meat is coming from and the way that it was um, raised and the impact that it had on the, on the planet, because there are ways of um, there are ways of lessening the impact of that. So I really appreciate um, kind of a lot of the things that you're pointing to there. Thank you. And you hear me, you know, often when I teach, and particularly tonight, I'm asking, how does that feel in the body, right? How does this feel when we know that we're causing harm? Or how does it feel when we offset? It's only like 2 or $3, I think, for to offset the carbon emission of a flight. And for me, that makes me feel really good, you know? Like, it is a fine line, as Louisa mentioned, between self-righteous um, and just feeling this is acceptable. This is okay. Uh, so not causing harm to ourself because we're causing harm, you know, not beating ourselves up um, because we are finding these ways uh, that we might be inadvertently or more overtly causing harm is also really important, you know? So thanks for sharing all that. Uh, this is Matthew. Um, I love resting in awareness of sensation. And I chose sound because I just love <laughs> taking a break and just focusing on any sensation. But sound is a really a favorite. And I was really pleased to see that I don't cause much harm. I felt real confident in that my behavior causes minimal harm to myself and others. My footprint carbon wise is pretty teeny tiny because I haven't been on a flight in five years and I don't own a car. <laughs> um, so I had not reflected on any of that. So it was an interesting exercise for me to sort of be asked to assess those things mm -hmm. and to feel pretty clean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. I like that you use the word assess, and that's really what all of these ethics are. This this invitation of this this series of classes is to kind of assess, you know, like where am I with the ally I orienting to these different um, ways of being in the world, these different concepts of ethics, and um, some of them we might feel pleased and satisfied with the work that we've done, the research that we've done, the ways of mitigating or offsetting or lessening. The harm. Um, and that's why it's so important that we have that feel or we can feel into what's arising. Um, so when it's when we're feeling good, it's it's available to us. And likewise, unfortunately, when we're feeling bad, that's also good for this conversation, these conversations. So 
sometimes I think, so I am, I, I, it's kind of funny that it does seem like this, this series of classes is turning into like a commentary on meat eating, <laughs> but, uh, I am plant-based and I, I, even, even within me not eating animals, insects are still dying when the, the fields are tilled or when the trucks are driving the produce to a market, they're running over animals or insects. So even my aspiration to not cause suffering for other beings in my eating habits, it's still happening, right? I've lessened it to a degree that I feel is workable, but um, it's important to kind of really look deeply under the covers of, of how we might be causing harm for self, others, the environment. So what else is coming up both in for the practice, but also just this idea of do no harm in general? Yeah. 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 I, um, so during the practice, the, um, like, it's such a big thing. Like once, once I connect into, once I get out of like relational do no harm, like with people, like my people network, I feel like I've got a handle on that. Um, but once we get into like environment and like the globe, then I am so in overwhelm and I'm like really searching for the I want to say compassable way to interact with it like what is what keeps it in workable right because one of the things that I uh love about nature is that it is so big right like part of what I feel it's it's I don't know my job with it or its job with me is to remind me that I'm this little teeny part of this gigantic thing and so if I'm this little teeny part of this gigantic thing, then it's hard to hold on to, I don't know, the value of my impact. Um, so that's a, that's a interesting, uh, it's an interesting both and, like how do I hold on to what I want to be responsible for and uh, still like really realize that I can't keep this scope in mind at the same time, I have to take it. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, uh, the really intense resonance with what Louisa said um, about the, you know, there's a need for activists to have a soundbite and yet the soundbite doesn't always serve. And that resonance, like, like, I don't know, it just gets louder or the disresonance of the soundbite versus the intent of the soundbite um, gets gets more intense as I age, I think. So those were the two things that came up. For me. What doesn't, when you said that um, it doesn't serve, what doesn't it serve? So, so if, if the intention of uh, ed, uh, raising animals for meat is bad, is like, comes out as meat is bad, right? Then, then the the ways that it could be workable, or the the places on the planet where that is in fact a more copacetic uh, percentage, like a larger percentage of uh, plants to animals in terms of of how a community supports itself, just because of of where they are and what the climate is, like there the 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 inability of the soundbite of there's huge problems with factory farming and we're doing horrible damage translating to meat is bad right so how do we like how how do activists hold on to being responsible about a point that that uh you know it's important like that's an important point that those things are mm -hmm. and yet the the like how is that how is that hitting and, and how do we hold on to nuance in in a you know soundbite driven we are a soundbite driven culture for sure here right here right now yeah yeah i appreciate you pointing to the nuance because that's right you know the context and the nuance super important and i think that's also why it's really important that we look in you know that we don't rely so heavily on the soundbite and more like what does this mean for me 
what's my intention? What's my motivation? How do I want to orient myself to my carbon footprint, to eating animals, to participating in capitalism, you know? And, and like, just to reiterate, it's nuanced. There's a lot under the covers. And that's why it's important that we have these conversations and we take time to reflect because we do live in a society that is trying to make it easier for us, more convenient for us. And we lose all of that nuance. <clears throat> Thank you. What else is coming up? We still have a little bit more time to talk, kind of harm is a do no harm is an ethic and a practice in the world mm -hmm. uh, hi i'm grace um for me um i'm kind of in a place where my life in my life where i need to, there's a lot of work that i need to do on myself first um, so I've had a lot of loss. So when I think about do no harm, there's just been a lot of messages in my head that are harmful to myself. And it's it's been really difficult um, to focus beyond myself at this point in time because um, I've been going through a certain level of grief. But I recognize that uh, I'm slowly starting to edge out a little bit more to the relationships in my life. And at some point when I'm further along can better focus on the world. Um, but yeah, I, I, I've just been thinking about some of the messages in my mind that have been playing about how much further I need to go. How I don't, I'm not in a good place. It reinforces the, the harmful state of being in my body. Um, yeah, so that's what I, and yesterday I went to physical therapy because I've been having an issue with my left hip. It took me two months to get an appointment. And then I found out that the, the issue is related to emotional stress. And it was so mind boggling. So I thought it was related to my running or maybe I did something wrong in yoga, but it's all just being reinforced by maybe like harmful things that I'm saying to, um, to myself. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and, um, you know, the bravery and the vulnerability it takes to share what you shared. Thank you for that. How does it feel to say that out loud to a group of people? Uh, very safe space. Safe space. Yeah. 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 And we had to kind of create that safety for ourselves. You know, um, it's certainly supportive to do it in a center like this, but also like how are ways that we can create that safety in our inner world? Um, and I am a firm believer and I already said it a few times, but one of the, the, the primary ways that we embody ethics is by taking care of ourselves, right? And so if right now do no harm for you is an inside job and actually trying to look outside of that would actually cause more harm, then that's enough. You know, that's why I love that the mindfulness practice is a training ground in not causing harm. We might not get it right all the time. We not but be perfect at it and how we move about the world. But first, we have to take care of ourselves. Every single one of these ethics starts with ourself. Um, and so I really applaud you for being able to identify that boundary. And in a way, you are taking care of others by by turning in and being with this difficulty, the grief and the pain and um the inner dialogue. That's a master class. Thank you for doing that work. Yeah. Something that I've been thinking a lot about too is this, um, you know, we, I taught a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about the precepts. This is, this is in Buddhist teaching around do not steal and um, was really reflecting on this idea of like, if we participate in capitalism, we're stealing. We are taking advantage of the labor of others. This entire country, our entire economy was built on the backs of slaves. So like, uh, even just 
continuing to participate in our economy the way that it is right now is causing harm, you know, kind of retrospectively and, and also now. Um, kind of continuing to um, propagate the systems of oppression and discrimination and separation that capitalism thrives on. And so for me in particular, it's like, God, every time I go into the grocery store, I'm like, ah, oh. and then I start getting swept away, you know, like the judgments and then the feeling of like, oh my God, this is so overwhelming. How am I supposed to eat if I can't participate in capitalism. And so this is really where it goes back to, I can't necessarily do no harm right now, but I can be aware of the harm that I'm causing. I can try and lessen it in the most, in the best that I can, and that I can stay with my experience. Cause if I, if I push it away, you know, and I just numb myself. So every time I go into the grocery store, I'm not thinking about it then that's actually continuing to harm, create harm. So even though it's very uncomfortable and it kind of rubs on me every time, it I feel like it's responsible. You know, I need to remember. And then how can I take action? For me, there's lots of different ways. You know, teaching this course is one of my ways of, of kind of um, counteracting or trying to find antidotes, uh, looking at my carbon footprint, um, how I'm participating in the world have, have gotten, as we were talking about earlier with Louisa, it's like finding that line of what feels right for me, because it doesn't serve anyone. If I'm just kind of, as one of my teachers says, constantly getting the whip out and self-deprecating and feeling bad about what I'm doing. Um, it's really why I like to emphasize, this is more about the awareness, the, the kind, gentle awareness that we can bring to the harm that we might be doing um, in the world. One other thought, and then I would like to just offer kind of a closing practice. Um, I've been really experimenting or diving deeply into nonviolent communication, non-accusatory communication, and really looking at how my words are causing harm and how I express myself might be causing harm. And while I feel true and authentic to what I say, um, I am becoming more aware of the way that I say it and kind of taking accountability for my own emotions rather than blaming other people for it has been a really big thing for me to look at this, the harm, mitigating harm through my speech. Um, so, you know, we talk a lot about actions and behaviors, but there's also the outer speech, how we're speaking to each other and the inner speech, you know, the inner critic. And so cultivating that sense of self-compassion, you notice, and even though that was a mindfulness practice, there's a lot of self-compassion being woven into that practice. Oh, it makes sense that my mind moved away. Oh, let me, let me try and relax. Where am I tightening up? How can I soften? How can I meet the discomfort of this practice with a sense of ease like we would in a standard self-compassion practice? And this also relates to our work in looking at this, these ethical ways of being, like being compassionate for ourselves. It makes sense that we're participating in this world because that's how it was set up. Um, so just sharing that to kind of create some space for you to look at all the different aspects, all these nuanced, like the big ways and the small, the, the really broad and the really detailed. Um, so I really wanna invite you, this whole series has really been about seeing the time together as planting seeds that you can continue nourishing and watering even after class. So maybe taking some time in the coming days to reflect on how you might be causing harm inadvertently to self, to others, to your community, to the environment in general. Um, ways to poten potentially lessen that, how it feels in the body, um, create, have conversations with other people, you know, um, with your close friends, if that feels comfortable, but let the, the wheels keep turning and thinking about um, your impact in the world and how we can kind of um, move forward with this intention to not cause harm. So um, I'd like to end our time uh, with just a short practice. I think um, for me, in my journey and looking at harm, working with harm, both what has been done to me and also what I've done to others 
it really goes hand in hand with forgiveness. And so I wanted to just take the, the last um, five minutes that we have together to offer a practice in reflecting on some um, aspects of harm and then checking out what it's like to uh, offer a sense of forgiveness to ourselves, to others. Um, and this is very influenced by Jack, Jack Hornfield's meditations on forgiveness. Um, so I want to just invite you into uh, a posture for the next couple of minutes of a closing practice. Maybe closing the eyes, perhaps softening the gaze. And just checking in, how does it feel right now on the body after reflecting and listening and sharing stories of harm? And I'll offer some prompts here. So just following along with the sentiments of the words as we Begin by reflecting on how we may have caused harm for others. And there are many ways that I have hurt and harmed others, have betrayed or abandoned them, caused them suffering, knowingly or unknowingly, out of my pain, fear, anger, and confusion. perhaps sensing into any sorrow or regret or guilt that you might feel about these ways that you may have caused harm. And if it feels comfortable, perhaps trying out this phrase silently in your mind, I ask for your forgiveness. And then calling to mind ways that you may have brought harm to yourself, whether it's through speech, action, behavior, or in your inner world, even your meditation practice. There are many ways that I have hurt and harmed myself. I betrayed or abandoned myself many times through thought, word, or deed, knowingly or unknowingly. perhaps extending this sense of forgiveness to your own self. Perhaps repeating this phrase silently in your mind, I extend a full and heartfelt forgiveness. I forgive myself. And just notice what this is like what's arising in the body, the felt experience of this practice of asking and offering forgiveness. Notice if there's resistance or discomfort and see what it's like to be with that as long as it feels okay, workable. And then let's take a moment to consider ways that we may have been harmed by others. There are many ways that I have been harmed by others, abused or abandoned, knowingly or unknowingly, in thought, word, or deed. And I now remember in many ways others have hurt or harmed me, wounded me out of their fear, pain, confusion, anger. And to the extent that you're ready, perhaps offering extension of forgiveness to others that may have harmed you. Perhaps saying these phrases silent in your mind, I offer my forgiveness or I forgive you. And then to close our session tonight, I'd like to offer this poem by Chen Chen, who's a Chinese American poet about the idea of doing no harm. I am practicing nonviolence today. I'm not going to shove the person who cut in front of me on the sidewalk. 
I'm not going to say anything to the barista who made my coffee wrong again. I'm not going to curse the political figurehead who makes my blood boil on the news. No, I'll be gentle as a butterfly, as a deer that has found the last patch of sun in a clearing, as a lover who has found another lover. Today, I will do no harm, not even to myself, who bears the brunt of my own violence, who needs more mercy than I offer to others. But today, I will try. I will see if the world seems brighter, less of a nightmare, less of a fist slamming my head and heart. I will see if nonviolence is a shield, a salve, a grace, a strength, or if it's just a word, a silly game I play to feel good about myself. Either way, it's a start. A step out of the house into the light of the world I can only hope one day will hold me gently in its massive loving arms. If there's any intention you'd like to set as we come to an end of our practice, how you'd like to move forward into the world, how you'd like to explore at a deeper level the harm that you may be causing self, others, or environment. Perhaps that is an intention simply to be aware, to do the research, to lessen the impact, to start a dialogue on more ethical ways of being in the world and our communities. And letting the energy of any insights or compassion that has arisen in this exploration of ethics tonight to linger with you into the next moments of life and into the days ahead. And if it feels comfortable together as a group, we can follow one more breath deeply into the body. And on the out breath, letting go of the breath letting go of this session and knowing that there's never really an end to this practice. So even as we make the transition back to open eyes and begin to move around into the next moments of life, we can still continue to practice, do no harm. Thank you all for joining me tonight. As I mentioned, the San Francisco Dharma Collective is a community run organization. Um, our teachings here, for the most part, are offered freely. Um, so um, it's an act of generosity for us to be in the world and propagate these teachings. Uh, and we thrive on your generosity. So any uh, donation that you would like to make in return to help keep our collective operating and our teachers compensated is greatly appreciated, but also knowing that that's not required. Um, I will be teaching um, this series. Actually, we've extended all the way through May. Um, so we're going to take our time for the next um, five Tuesdays, I think, uh, and explore more ethics deeply. Uh, kind of have these meditations and conversations all the way through May every Tuesday. I'll also be holding space for the Queer Sangha this weekend on Saturday at um, 530. Uh, we'll be doing some queer inner child healing. Uh, so please join me for that. And any other announcements, Tia or Daniel? Uh, 